Hello, my friends from around the world. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. And thanks for joining me here at JP's Path of Awareness. I'm so grateful to be with you and welcome to the new followers. So grateful to be able to share this light with with you from around the world. And so great to talk with many of you directly, more and more. So I was going to continue on here with the Art of Meditation from Joel's, Joel S. Goldsmith's book and, um, and finishing up the second ch chapter I just finished. I'm going to continue on to the third, but um, finishing up with that chapter, his last sentence was, The secret is the awakening of the sleeping Christ. And that is the purpose of meditation. So chapter three is called The Practice. Here are many forms of meditation leading to the awakening of the sleeping Christ within. There is no one way suitable to all people. Each person must ultimately find the way which appeals to his particular consciousness. All methods call forth that deep sense of humility which knows I can of mine own self do nothing. Satisfactory meditation requires a letting go of personal selfhood with its egotistical claim to possessing a wisdom of its own in order that the power which we call the Father within can take over. This power is within us not within our body, but within our consciousness. And through meditation we permit it to escape from within, that it may act on the without and become the savior to our experience. The initial stage of meditation may be a contemplation of God, the beauty of God's universe, the law of God, and the activity of God. Our life becomes that of a beholder, beholding the glory of God in all things in the green grass, in the gentle breeze, in the turbulence of the ocean, and in the calm of the night. In this contemplative state of being, we cannot behold anything in this world without at the same moment recognizing its cause, the invisible spiritual activity which produced it. We should never look at a sunrise or a sunset without instantly realizing the spiritual nature of that which brought it into expression. God the creative principle of the mountains, the skies, and the seas. God, the creative principle of that which fills the air with birds and stocks the seas with fish. If we live continuously in the contemplation of the invisible presence and power underlying all things, this very place whereon we stand is holy ground. As we ponder the glory of God, contemplate his wonders, our mind is stayed on God. Fewer and fewer extraneous thoughts thrust themselves upon our consciousness. We are able to sit for many minutes sometimes for as long as an hour, finding ourselves at peace in our contemplation of God 
and the beauty of the spiritual universe. Contemplation lifts our consciousness into an atmosphere of receptivity, into a consciousness where miracles can take place. The conscious thinking mind comes to a stop, and the invisible presence and power is given an opportunity to function. Until that it, that invisible selfhood, that invisible presence and power is permitted to operate in consciousness. We are merely functioning on the mental level. The human mind cannot be the avenue for the activity of the soul. A higher consciousness must be reached. Through the higher consciousness, through that mind which was in Christ Jesus, the soul reveals itself and its activity as our individual experience. That which imparts itself to us from the inner consciousness is power, not the thoughts we think, not our statements or beliefs, but that which reveals itself from within on the inner plane is the power with signs following. This inner consciousness is without boundary, and by rising to a higher level of consciousness, we become aware of that which lies far beyond our immediate knowledge. This higher consciousness is unlimited and imparts its wisdom to us infinitely and eternally. It is that insulated place within our own being where the ceaseless activity of the outer world does not intrude. If we are faithful in the practice of contemplation and the simpler forms of meditation, this practice will lead us from one form of meditation to another until we arrive at the actual experience of hearing the still, small voice, of receiving divine guidance from within, and the being divinely led, being divinely led every step of the way. Let us begin by sitting in a comfortable position. Some people prefer a straight chair, even a hard one, so that they are compelled to sit in an upright position, whereas others find themselves more comfortable in an armchair. Keep the feet flat on the floor, hold the body erect, with the hands resting in the lap. In this natural, relaxed, but alert position, begin your meditation with some passages of scripture that may come to your thought, or, if you like, you may open the Bible or a book of spiritual wisdom and read for a short time. You may read only one paragraph, or you may re need to read ten pages before some particular thought attracts your attention. When this occurs, close your book and take that thought into your meditation. Think about it. Hold it right in front of you. Repeat it to yourself. Ask yourself, why did this particular quotation come to me? Does it have an inner meaning? What is its significance to me at this time? As you continue meditating, another statement may come to your attention. Consider both of these thoughts. Is there any relationship between them? Is there any coherence? Why did this quotation follow the first one? By this time, probably a third idea and then a fourth will have come. And all these thoughts will have come out of your awareness out of your consciousness. 
In this short period of meditation, which may have been of only a minute's duration, you have experienced God revealing itself. You have opened yourself to divine intelligence and love. This is the word of God, which is quick and sharp and powerful. To have received one statement of truth from the depths of our own being is evidence that we have had a degree of realization of God. Peace and quiet descend upon us and a sense of well-being and assurance well up within us. This form of meditation, if practiced faithfully, opens our consciousness to permit God to function in our life, to permit Christ to live our life, but it must be practiced. It is necessary, therefore, to return to our meditation at our first opportunity and to repeat the process in the middle of the day and again in the evening. We may find that we are unable to sleep continuously throughout the night. In the middle of the night, the demand comes, meditate. These periods of silence, reflection, introspection, meditation, and finally communion prepare us to receive the inner grace. Even though we seem to be making no progress in these three or four minute periods of meditation during the day or night, even though we seem to feel no response, let us not become discouraged because we have no way of judging the results of our efforts in terms of a single period of meditation or even after a week or a month of this practice. To expect immediate results from the practice of meditation would be the same as expecting to play Bach or Beethoven after the first music lesson. Would it not be absurd after the first six hours of practicing the scales to give up in despair because we have not achieved immediate proficiency in an art which requires a high degree of technical skill. If we are serious in our desire to master this art, we would recognize that from the moment we begin the practice of our scales, something was taking place in both mind and muscle. It might require a whole year of practice before any degree of skill was attained. The final achievement cannot be measured in terms of the hourly or daily or even monthly periods of practice. So it is with meditation. We have made a beginning the very first time that we close our eyes and realize, I am seeking the grace of God. I am seeking the word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I know not what to pray for, so I do not pray for anything of this world. I listen for thy voice, wait for thy word. This form of meditation repeated a dozen times a day would eventually change our entire life. And it is possible that changes might be evident within a month. Every time we turn to that inner center, we are recognizing that we, of our own self, can do nothing. We are seeking the kingdom within. This is true humility, true prayer, an acknowledgement of the nothingness of human wisdom, human power, and human strength. It is acknowledging that wisdom, power, and strength come from the infinite invisible. These periods of silence create an atmosphere of spirit in which the activity of spirit, without our knowing it or having any awareness of it, goes before us to make the desert bloom, blossom as the rose. 
Here is an example of a simple form of meditation in which we begin with a central idea, theme, or quotation, and ponder it until its inner meaning is revealed. I can of mine own self do nothing. The Father within me, he doeth the works. The meaning of the first part is immediately apparent. But what is meant by the statement that the Father within me doeth the works? What is the Father within me? Who is this Father within me? We know that when Jesus made that statement, he was referring to God. It must mean then that God within me doeth the works. Jesus said that it is your Father and my Father. So he seems to be telling me that there is a God power, something within that doeth the works. The same Father that was in Christ Jesus is also in me. This Father within me, this He, is greater than He that is in the world, greater than the problems of the world, the life, intelligence, and wisdom that is within me is greater than he that is in the world, greater than my enemies, greater than my ills, greater than my ignorance, greater than my fears, greater than my doubts, even greater than my sins. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. This Christ is the Father within me, the divine power within, which Jesus said, will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The Father within, the Christ, which strengtheneth me, will never leave me nor forsake me. Before Abraham was, this Father was within me, and it is with me even unto the end of the world. It is a presence and a power that has been with me from the beginning of time. Even when I did know it, it was, even when I did not know it was there, and it will be with me throughout all eternity. It will be with me regardless of where I am. If I make my bed in hell, if I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, this Father is ever with me. It is a presence that never leaves me, a power that always strengthens me, that goes before me to make the crooked places straight and the rough places plain. I feel thy hand in mine. I know I know that there is a power that can do all things. I know that there is a presence that can live my life for me, make my decisions, and show me the path of life. The whole kingdom of God is within me. Thou wilt never leave me nor forsake me. I can never doubt thy presence. All this thou hast revealed to me from within myself. I thank thee, Father, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them to me, a babe in truth, a beginner on the spiritual path. This practice of pondering a scriptural quotation is not too difficult for a beginner or too simple for an advanced student. As in the example given above, a central thought or quotation is used in an attempt to understand its inner meaning and to receive light on it, so that never again will it be used as a quotation or as a metaphysical cliché. These primary forms of meditation should be understood and practiced before the higher, more difficult forms are attempted. 
Let us remember that our object is to develop a state of receptivity to the still, small voice. In meditation, we do not think about our problem. We turn within and wait, and wait, and wait. We wait for three, four, or five minutes. If, at the end of that time, we have not felt a response within ourselves, we get up and go about our customary duties. An hour or two later, we again meditate, waiting silently, waiting until the voice of God utters itself within us. The thoughts that race through our mind do not concern us. We are not interested in them. We are waiting until we feel the activity of the Christ stirring within us. If we do not feel the touch of the Christ within three or four minutes, we return to our daily tasks. But two or three hours later, we meditate again. If it is necessary, we continue this practice for years. But if we are persistent, the day will come when there will be an inner response, which will give us the assurance that there is that within us which the Master called the Father, that which Paul knew as the Christ. The beginner should meditate three times a day or, if that is not possible, at least twice a day, in the morning and at night. There is no one who should find this too difficult to do because everybody gets up and everybody goes to bed. Everybody can spare a few extra minutes in the morning and at night, even if he cannot find one other minute for this purpose during the 24 hours. For serious students, however, there will be always another interval sometime during the day. Gradually, these periods of meditation become a regular part of our existence, and we are meditating at any or every hour of the day or night, sometimes for only half a second or for several minutes at a time sometimes while driving a car or doing housework. We learn to open consciousness, if it is but for a second, and find ourselves in a state of receptivity. Take any aspect or facet of spiritual truth. It might be the term light, there have been innumerable people who might be called the light of the world. Jesus was that light, as were Elijah, Paul, and John. But what is meant by the phrase, the light of the world? Let us turn to the Father and ask Him to give us light on the subject of light. As we develop the listening ear, we gain the spiritual sense of the term rather than the literal meaning as given in the dictionary or the interpretation given to it by some metaphysical writer. We then have our own God-given light on the subject of light. Perhaps the meaning of the word soul is not clear. Very few know that soul will very few know what soul really means. It is one of the most profound mysteries of spiritual wisdom. To understand it, let us turn to the Father for a revelation on the subject of the soul. Sooner or later, as we maintain a state of receptivity, we shall begin to receive impartations on the nature of the soul. In this way, we learn to take into our consciousness any word or subject about which we are seeking understanding and to wait in a state of expectancy for the light to shine on it and reveal its meaning to us. And to pause on that note, it's from personal experience. 
I practiced this many years ago, but for a couple years, actually working with different words like consciousness and soul. And it is incredible what he speaks of here, how when you really ask the Father how to define that in your own life for your own being, it's incredible what it allows as you do that through your day, like I did with consciousness for like a pretty close to a solid year, just recognizing consciousness all through the day and through the night. And what starts appearing and what's being revealed to us, again, and this is as you become more receptive, is that truth of the Spirit and what it includes in that how so much more is there than what our five senses tell us. So it really gives us that infinite invisible, as Joel has spoken of. But Joel continues here. Most of us are familiar with the passage, My grace is sufficient unto thee. We know the words but they will be of little or no significance in our lives unless their inner meaning is revealed through meditation. Only then do these words live for us and become the Word. When we awaken in the morning, we should consciously bring to remembrance the statement that God's grace is our sufficiency in all things. We do not repeat it over and over again as a vain repetition or affirmation, but rather do we take this statement into consciousness and dwell on it. Thy grace is my sufficiency. Thy grace, yes. The Father's grace within me. The Father is within me. And it is the Father's grace that is my sufficiency in all things. Now I know whose grace it is, but what is grace? What do we mean by grace? What is it? It may take two or three minutes for us to perceive that thy grace is not afar off, but is within. That may be the extent of the unfoldment for the moment. Two or three hours later, however, we again bring this statement to conscious remembrance. This time, we may recall that we were considering the word grace. It will not be long before we begin to realize that we have heard grace described as the gift of God, as that which comes from God without our earning it, deserving it, or laboring for it. It is something which comes without personal effort. This grace, therefore, which is to be our sufficiency in all things, is an activity of God within us. In meditation, the meaning of grace may be revealed to one of us in one way, and to another in an entirely different way. But to both, it may come with such force as to open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. To each one something different will unfold from that which is given to anyone else. If we are in earnest, we shall take the statement, My grace is sufficient unto thee, into consciousness many times during the day. If we abide in that statement of truth, we shall be meditating and thus fulfilling one of the most important teachings that has ever been given to the human race. If we abide in me, if ye 
abide in me, and my words abide in you. Ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. If we keep the word alive in our consciousness by dwelling on it for five, four, five, eight, ten, twelve times a day, and also when we awaken in the middle of the night, we shall find that we are meditating. We are letting the word of truth abide in us, and Christ becomes the activity of our consciousness. What is Christ? If you really desire to know what the Christ is, begin with his, with this very humble acknowledgement. Father, I know so little about the Christ. Help me to understand the Christ. Then close your eyes and keep your attention on the idea of the Christ. Every time the mind tries to wander, Gently bring it back. Keep your attention centered on the Christ. Ultimately, you will catch the vision of the real meaning of the Christ, a meaning that you will never quite be able to explain to anyone else. But you yourself will know it. The Christ will be an actual presence in your consciousness. It will be a power an influence, a being. Yet, it will be something that you cannot define. No matter what you might say about the Christ, it would not be that. One day, however, as you persist in this meditation, the Christ is alive in your heart, and then you hear, I will never leave thee. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. What whithersoever thou goest, I will go. I will be right there with you. Only remember to look for me. Expect me. Do not look for any sign. Do not look for anything outside. Look only to me. If you look only to me, one day when you think you need water, it will come out of a rock. Or when you think you need food, it will come out of the sky, but never look for it. That is the sin, looking for it. Look only to me. I am walking beside you. I am sitting within you. I am resting in your heart. I am in your mind in your consciousness. I am right here in your arms, down in your fingertips. Do you feel me? I am with you. I go before you to make the crooked places straight. I will never leave you. Look unto me and be saved. Seek me while I may be found and all these things shall be added unto you. Seek me. From the moment that awareness is ours, we have demonstrated Paul's statement, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Then, this atmosphere of the Christ is within us always and our very physical presence becomes a benediction to everyone with whom we come in contact. Because we are there. Because we are there? No. Because the Christ is there as the light of our being. The way is to pray without ceasing. We consciously open ourselves to the realization of the Christ until the time comes when you and I no longer have to do it consciously because there is no longer a you or an I to do it. Look unto me, the Christ, and be ye saved. And that's
that's the end of chapter three. I'll continue on with the next one in chapter four. Next recording. Many blessings. Again, let's um, look forward to talking with many of you on a deeper level. And stay in that consciousness of the Christ. As you take plenty of time in the silence, listen for that still small voice. Blessings. Talk on the next one.